Um, I think we'll start. I see the numbers are slowing down. Uh, welcome, everyone, and thank you for being here. This uh, is an event in collaboration with the Women's Studio Workshop and the Carolee Schneemann Foundation, and it's an event in celebration of the reprint of the Carolee Schneemann Parts of the Body Haves book. I have a few small notes from the beginning from Printed Matter. Um, we will be recording this session. It's also being live streamed to YouTube. It will also be available on YouTube afterwards if you want to watch it back. And uh, we welcome Q&A from everyone, all the attendees. So please feel free to use the Q&A feature and send any questions you have. Rachel will be taking them at the end. Um, for the event, we are going to start with a small introduction from Rachel Turner. Then we'll have Erin uh, Zona, director of the Women's Studio Workshop, who will be talking about the book itself. We'll have three readings, uh, starting with artist Lorraine O'Grady, then curator Jasmine Wahi, and writer Stephanie LaCava. And then we'll end with a Q&A with all the speakers. Our moderator for the evening is Rachel Turner, and Rachel is the director of the Carolee Schneemann Foundation. She is also an established art critic, editor, and faculty member of the Eugene Lang College at the New School. Um, Rachel, go ahead. Hi. Thank you. <clears throat> Make sure I am unmuted. Okay, hi. My name is Rachel Churner, um, and I am so very pleased to be with you all virtually. And um, I'm very grateful uh, to tonight's panelists um, who are joining us to celebrate the reprint of Carolee Schneemann's Parts of a Body House book. With its hand stamped pages, tipped in photos, blood smeared single ply toilet paper sheets and trifold charting the physical attributes of her lovers, this is no ordinary book. It is, as Carolee wrote in the colophon, a prototype for my big book. Each element in this edition culled from mounds of related material. It is a releasing of the recent past into the present, a unitary life view, all about the same thing. And I can't say what it is but see it, live it. I am particularly excited tonight um, that we will get to not only see the book, but hear from it as Lorraine O'Grady, Jasmine Wahi, and Stephanie LaCava read selections and help us live it. It is Carolee's words in all their radicality and transgressive intimacy that we want to hold close tonight. As Johanna just mentioned, we'll begin this evening with an introduction to the product project by Aaron Zona. Erin is the artistic director of Women's Studio Workshop and she spearheaded this project, working closely with Kara Lee and after her death with La Nina, as you'll see, to complete a facsimile of the 1972 original that is breathtaking in its detail. Without Erin's technical and conceptual brilliance or the dedication and perseverance of her team at Women's Studio Workshop, of Lila Doherty, Carolee's former studio manager, of Annalise Biednell, the estate's liaison at PPOW, and of Rachel Helm, our foundation manager, we would not have this outstanding object. A special and sincere thanks to each of them. Following Erin's presentation, artist Lorraine O'Grady will begin the readings. As one of the most significant contemporary figures working in performance, conceptual and feminist art, O'Grady needs little introduction. I do, however, want to call attention to her retrospective, shockingly her first, that will open at the Brooklyn Museum on March 5th. Both and, such a gorgeous title, not only features 12 of the major projects that O'Grady has produced over her four decade career, but it debuts a new installation, one that is eagerly awaited. I am honored that she is here tonight. I am also honored to introduce Jasmine Wahi, the Holly Block Social Justice Curator at the Bronx Museum and founder of Newark's Project for Empty Space. Jasmine's visual activism offers a powerful model for how art world institutions and audiences can affect change rather than just talk about it. Thank you for being here. And finally, I welcome esteemed writer Stephanie LaCava, who has written for numerous publications from Art Forum to Vanity Fair. Her most recent book out only several months ago is The Super Rationals, part of Semiotext's Native Agent series. Now, when you rush out to your local bookstore to buy Stephanie's book, you may not find Carolee's very special edition. It is, however, available from Printed Matter or Women's Studio Workshop, and I hope that you'll go to the Printed Matter website to purchase one. In closing, I want to say a few words about the foundation. 
The Carol H. Naiman Foundation is dedicated to preserving and promoting the legacy of Carol H. Naiman and advancing the understanding of her work through scholarship, exhibitions, and publications, including a major retrospective at the Barbican Center in London that will open in 2022. I also want to announce that from March 12th through the 14th, the Rosendale Theater will present a weekend of online screenings of work by Carol Lee and Barbara Hammer with several panel discussions about the films of these feminist legends. Details will be up soon at our brand new website, schneemanfoundation.org. This evening, we are of course not in person, but scattered across lands, time zones, and screens. However, I want to acknowledge the unceded land of the Muncie Lenape peoples on which Carol Lee Schneeman's home and studio her source of creative energy stand, as well as the workshop in which she created this book. The Carol H. Naiman Foundation recognizes the significance of this land for Lenape nations past, present, and future, and acknowledges that it was built upon the exclusions and erasures of many indigenous peoples. We commit to honoring the land and the people who have stewarded it through generations. Thank you to Printed Matter for hosting tonight's event. Thank you to our guests and thank you all for being here to celebrate with us. I look forward to your questions after the readings. And with that, I pass it to Lorraine. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I'm going to read something from a Carol Lee that was written, uh, the first part at any rate, was written in 1972 in England uh, when she was about 33 years old. Uh, it starts with a question from the liberated cockbook for women and others, from the liberated cockbook for women and others. The title is Americans Eaching Apple Pie, January 1972. One, go into the kitchen with defiant joyful anger. On this scruffy battleground, you will lay down the cookbook forever. You will cease competition with untold legions of sublimated, self-satisfied female psyches engaged over the centuries in a pursuit of excellence through flour, grease, onion, turnips, blenders, colander, strainer, boilers, mincers, graters, choppers, whiskers, mincers, beaters. Desist, desist, stop, stop now. Two, put on an apron and Liberation through joyous aggression, says the I Ching. The abandonment of false illusions, says the I Ching. You are in the kitchen because you do not have a penis. Keep this in mind as you, as you crush the garlic with the heel of your shoe. Of your shoe. <laughs> you are in this kitchen because you have or might have a baby. Three, apple pie as direct contact with materials. A recipe based on my principle of kinetic theater, circa 1962, but good forever. This pie offers self-realization. You will be the best woman in the world. American as apple pie, just like mums. Remember, the oven is your womb. Let's do it right. Four, ingredients. Apples, one sack of whole wheat flour, 100% stone ground. Barbados sugar, egg yolks, safflower oil, butter, honey, Cinnamon, lemon. Open the flour sack with your right hand and scoop up three handfuls. Drop into a bowl. Pinch off a big lump of butter. Drop in bowl. Pour in two quick turns of oil. Add small pile brown sugar. 
Use both hands to scrunch it all up in your fingertips to a nice crummy mass, soft. Sprinkle a few drops of cold water on top, mix again. Now it is sticky and ready to be patted into a baking dish or two. Might as well make two pies. Slide hunk of butter all over baking dish. Wash apples. Don't peel if organically grown. Pat pastry all over the dish. Use small lumps when you press flat until they all mesh and cover the dish. Now you can make these cut, now you can make these cut finger indentations along the top. Slice apples, add bits of sugar, butter bits, lemon juice, drops, drips of honey. If you have some yogurt or sour cream about, take your fingers and smear it over the apple tops. Have faith. Note, if any ingredient falls on the floor, just pick them up and put where they should have gone. My father always said, people eat about three pounds of dirt every year. Five, now for the butterfly. Take bits of remaining pastry in your fingers and flatten out makes a vague sort of butterfly shape. Lay these over edge, over the apples, pinch them onto the edge of the pastry on the side of the baking dish. Keep laying the bits out until the top is covered. That's all, stick in oven. Six, I do not preheat the oven because I think it gives a cruel shock to the apples and flour and the dish. Rather a nice gradual baking. Baking is like waiting for pubic hair to grow when you're 12 years old. Put it in and go away. Pretend nothing is happening. You will suddenly remember pies in the oven just in time to run, look, find they are still raw. Be patient and haughty. After a time, you will see butter bubbling, smell absolute evidence. Check pastry at bottom for crispness, sample some, amazing. Verdict, very sensuous and easy to do. Not uptight making, a true apple pie, archetypal. That's interestingly, that's interestingly for some reason, I should say, excuse me, most interestingly, for some reason, it tastes of coconut. Serve to friends whose adoration you wish to bind forever. This was tested in the Bell Size Park Kitchens, UK. Chance of real fuck, of a cock lover heading for home, cervic head, rummaging, flashing, pulsing, a high rider, a voluptuous captain taking me far out with him, all touches, caresses, kisses, pinches, bites and howls, calls, and tenderness, gentleness, joy, what we call erotic intimacy, which I have never, never, ever felt from an Englishman. That is a warm, that is a warm appreciative connectiveness, which a couple express to each other out of bed by looks and touches and delight. Oh, moon spun spinning, take me, take me home to cowboys and woodsmen and cotsmen and swordsmen, to lovers, singers, racers, rowers, drivers, men whose identity is sex charged, who love to love women who are not afraid, 
who do not live out fear of cunt, who hold you tenderly, who penetrate ecstatically, who look in my eyes, who touch my hair, who know, who are not haunted by buggering, being buggered, who do not grow up apart from girls, who give Mary, who give Mary next door a penny to see when they, when they were five and put their fingers there when they were six, seven who can cherish a woman's sex as home to their own. Her difference defines their powers, who are easy with their power, who are not haunted by headmasters, who do not get beaten over adolescent pink buttocks with canes. American men who go for broke, who believe in romance, who bring me flowers, who see what they look at, who look at what who what is for them. Did you ever see an Englishman with his eyes full of his sexual longing for you? When he comes, does he think he's given you a gift or a mess? If he pleases, is pleased sexually, does he think you must be suspect because his sexuality is a burden to him? He is cut off. He cuts off. He was forbidden to long for his mother. She did not touch him early on. He cannot long for you. Stiff upper lip, get above it. Taught that his sexuality, emotions, and all personal troubles must be controlled, overcome by detachment by an effort of will, for the sake of self-image, country, family, school, team, queen. English women in pain get catatonic. They must be as passive, demure, and stupid as possible so they will not frighten English men. They are taught stiff upper lip too. A trembling upper lip cannot bring contact comfort, that slight involuntary trembling upper lip, that motion will drive away, that motion will drive away he whom they need. These men, these women are taught, we are each, we are each singular, separate, we live apart, even when we share a life together. A different emphasis, Americans believe we only exist apart, sing singularly. We come into full life together, combined, a unit with all the work of comprehension, communication. We only bear to be apart. London, spring 1970, winter 1971, all changes. An exception overrules. What was so, was so, is no longer welcome home. They say they have these, they say they have these fetid, life-destroying restraints. Among friends who are creative, expressive, free, fervid, problem of how lonely it can be, how to bring joys, trust, joys and trust together. They feel what I feel, they see it. They seem to live full work, love. And then they say, oh no, not really. Perhaps their, ex perhaps their expectations are really higher than mine, that they are less accepting of pain. When I can say the truth, it helps somewhere. And then it brings trouble surfacing. They say, glub, glub, yes, yes. I want to believe that. I want to, I want to believe that fuses let us feel what we want to feel. Then they say, but you are extreme, unnatural, a monster of, sexuali of sensuality, unbridled lust, basest of women, blow blowing up cock and cunt private love, loving. I want you. I want someone like you. No, not you. 
some way into my own desires, out of and out of my hurt, my own needs. No, no, hit me. It has to hurt. I'm doomed to shame, to suffer, and you too. I'm so glad, so glad, so glad. Rock, rock helps all move right in. Everybody moving, breathing, free a start. When I come home alone and get undressed, I might just smell my pants. Yes, I bet you do too. That's, that's me for sure. Images change, change. That's my smell when I'm, that's my smell when my lover is not here. I take out this filthy old t-shirt T-shirt he wore to work for a week. He put it in the laundry and I stole it away, kept it in my, in my closet, put it by my pillow. That's him, sniff, sniff. Also have collections of hair trimmings. One little clump from when I was 14. First love, hot aromas, breakdown, and, and worse, the memory of a beloved aroma breaks down too over the years. Photos can still charge, carry. Don't you all, don't you all sniff? Underpants, snot, socks, undershirts, shoes, fingers, armpits, balls, hairs, pussies. Don't you? Well, I proclaim it all normal and important. My cat agrees. In fact, she is dictating as usual. This has always been on her mind. Furthermore, someone who loves me likes the taste of my pee, asks me not to wipe after I piss. I told him, drip drops, drip down my thigh. He likes that part of my tastes, to taste. Once dazed, smiling, he raised his head from my cunt, opening my eyes, his face, smiling, are you smiling? Why are you smiling? A landscape, a garden, a Chinese dinner, he said. That just shows how sweet our intimacy is, he says. After I tell him I never saw a man so plainly sniffing a finger they had just scratched their balls with. November 1968. That's it, <laughs> the end. Should I go now, Rachel? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Hi everyone, thank you so much, Soreen, that was amazing. Um, I, um, I have a short presentation to kind of go through just a few of the details of the actual phys physical object that is the Parts of the Body House book and um, a few stories about working with Carolee on the book. Um, I have, will screen share a PowerPoint to show the um, a couple of things that really struck me about the parts that Lorraine just um, just shared as the uh, Americana eating apple pie. I don't know if this is the first place in which that ex that existed in print. I'm not sure. I know it existed again later in later publications, but it does appear in this book and um, and um, Carolee and I, one of our one of our final meetings that we had about the book, I made her uh, an apple crumble for us to eat when she was visiting the workshop. And it was the most delicious apple crumble. She talked about it like as if it was the greatest. And we talked about Americana eating apple pie. And, um, and I love that part about making apple pie for someone that you wanna bind yourself to forever. And it's really, that's really amazing. So I, I'd forgotten about that part. Um, and the New York Times recipe we decided was the best if you double the butter. So that's my advice <laughs> for all of you who may want to try it. Uh, so this is, um, you know, I um, I work for Women's Studio Workshop. I'm the artistic director, so I'm responsible for all of our um, the you know all of our publications and um, and the artists that we work with. 
I came here, we've been publishing artist books since 1979. We've published over 200 books in that time. And when I came to Women's Studio Workshop, I was, before I moved here, I was aware that Carolee Schneeman lived four miles down a nature trail um, to the workshop. And so I knew that I wanted to approach her about a project. In 2018, I, um, I visited her home and her studio and I told her that I was very interested in doing a publication with WSW. She has a friendship and relationship with our executive director and our, our the co-founders of WSW. So um, it wasn't coming really from necessarily nowhere, but um, I had never met her before. Uh, and she she seemed really open to it. And she said, um, I have I, I had all these ideas. Should we do a portfolio? Should we reprint a book? And she said, I have a very, her, I think these are her exact words. I have a very important book that almost no one has seen. <laughs> and, um, and she went, um, and we went upstairs and she pulled uh, parts of a body house book. And this is her copy. So the goals in reproducing this book were to produce Carolee's copy of Parts of a Body House 1972 um, uh, to her present day specifications. And this book has many elements in it. It has, um, it has um, menstrual blood, it has handwriting, it has photographs um, taped in, it has hand painting, it has lamination. Uh, there are so many elements in the book, uh, material elements as well as elements from her own sort of her own erotic life, domestic life, academic life um, that, that really come together in this book. And I think this book really can in any study of her work is really can be, be kind of the center of, of, of many of the themes that run through her, you know, her work. I did wanna um, just show one image of the original production. So this is Carolee working at Bojest Press. Um, they produced the book in 1972. Carolee went to Devon um, to, in the UK to actually produce the book. And there are some great stories, I believe about how Carolee actually took her cat Kitsch to England with her in order to produce this book. And there are great stories about Carolee getting Kitsch there and um, Kitsch coming back from England, which you don't do, you don't, you don't usually bring your cat with you um, for a year to, to stay abroad. But um, I love these production images and some of these are in the, are in the book as well. And I'll show that towards the end. Um, this is an example, this is a photo of the, of the reprint that we made. One of the things that was so, so important to Carolee in producing this book is that would, was that we kind of do it perfectly. And so um, uh, she really, really wanted all the materials and everything to kind of look the exact same way that the original was. This is a facsimile of her book, of her copy of the book. Um, the, uh, the interior of the book, many of the pages originally were produced uh, as mimeographs, which is a photocopy-like photocopy process in which a master is produced and then the photocopies are made after that. And so we decided to produce the book as a risograph. Um, so most of the pages are risograph. Here is an image, here are some images from the, um, from the 2020 um, edition. Another thing that was really exciting about working with Carolee, and I will talk about those images a little more in depth, but um, one of the things that was really exciting about working with Carolee is that she still kind of had everything um, for the book and exact sort of ideas about the way that she wanted these, th these um, items reproduced. So on many pages in the book, Every page is hand stamped with different images. You can see that Devon, the place where the book was made is a hand, camp, a hand carved st stamp, the Terrelee's personal archive that was um, used in original book production, as well as this lion stamp and then a, a pointer, a manicure, a printer's manicure there that um, we used in the production. And the day that we decided, okay, we're gonna do parts of the body parts of a body house book, Carolee said, oh, and I have all the original stamps, you can use them, but you can see that they're very degraded. And, um, and so we ended up having to uh, sort of figure out a way to digitally reproduce them. And so on, just to show you the depths that we went to to really create this the way that Carolee wanted is that we made an impression with the original lion stamp that you see in the middle from Carolee's archive and we stamped it several times. And then I had someone use Photoshop and pull those all terrible imprints together in order to get one perfect edition of what the lion stamp looked like. And then we had an, a new rubber stamp made, which you, which you see um, throughout the book. 
There are um, a couple of film stills from other pieces that are taped in the very front page of the book. On the left is the 1972 edition and on the right is the 2020 edition. Uh, our, the studio manager at, uh, at the studio here, Chris and I, we spent you know, all this time trying to find this yellow sort of leather cracked paper. Uh, and we could, it's not something that's really produced anymore, but we were able to find folio folders and cut them down. So the links that we, that we went to um, at the time maybe felt a little bit like too far, but now that the, now that the book is finished, I'm really proud that we, that we did. Um, so the image that you see there of Carolee with her cat Kitch, that was actually part of a film that Carolee had cut the film stills so that in each of the 90 books, there was one film still. And this is a, this is a positive film still. And so in order to reproduce it, we, um, we ended up high resolution scanning the film still, printing it out in negative as a, a laser jet or an inkjet print, then using black and white film to photograph the negative so that the, so that the black and white film would be a positive, which is like, when I was explaining to Carolee how we would do this and be on budget, she, she just kind of said, I trust you. <laughs> and I think that the, the result turned out very nice. Um, one last part of the book that I do want to highlight is that every edition, every copy of in the edition, in the original edition, had a piece of toilet paper um, that had a blot um, from, from Carolee's um, period. Um, and the way she explained this piece to me is that in the 60 of the original edition, she um, she had blotted herself throughout her menstruation period, and that those those images were the arc of her period, meaning that some were darker than others and, um, and some were lighter depending on the flow of the arc of her period. And I really was um, very dedicated to ensuring that this was a component in, in this book as well. And we had um, individuals who, who cared for, who were caring for Car Carolee um, uh, at the time um, donate their time to, um, to recreate these pieces for the new edition. So the new edition as well has these. So the top image is the page in the new edition of the book and the bottom it, um, is uh, Carolee's copy from 1972. Now, Carolee did um, pass away in March of 2019. And we had in January of 2019, finalized all of the production components for the book. Um, all the papers were selected by her, all the risograph inks, the modes for reproducing her handwriting and highlighting and everything were all decided before her death. But the thing that she was going to do was she was going to do a painting on the back cover of every copy of the 90 books. And so at the time, um, we just continued production and, and I knew that the books wouldn't be signed and that it didn't quite feel like Carolee felt present in production, but not as if it was really finished. And in April, I believe of 2019, her cat, La Nina, had an exhibition at PPOW um, that was called uh, Tooth and Paw. And this is one of the last exhibitions that, that Carolee worked on was La Nina's exhibition. And, and, um, and so it kind of just, became the right solution would be to have La Nina sign the back covers of all of these pages if she was willing to. Now, if you know Carolee or you know her work, you know that cats are magical and that you, um, you know, at one point when I first met Carolee, I tried to sort of push La Nina off of a chair and that was a mistake. You, you know, if, you, if, you, if the cat's in a chair, you pull up a different chair. You know, I learned that very quickly. <laughs> um, and so, I thought we'll set this up and if La Nina likes doing it, we'll have La Nina sign all of these books. And so we made, um, this is on Carolee's front porch of her farmhouse in New Paltz. We, we gathered um, dirt from the yard. We put some beet juice in it because it's safe for cats and that um, it adds a nice pigment. And we made up this mixture for La Nina and we sort of, um, this is Rachel Helm, the manager of the foundation, uh, encouraging Nina to walk across the prints with some cat food. Um, but we laid all the prints out as you can see and would sort of set Nina down in the mixture. And this cat, I, I, she knew what she was doing. That's all I can say. You know, we laid the prints down and she would walk across the prints until the, the row was finished. And then she would turn around and she would walk past again. You know, so she was, 
we we didn't make her do it you know she definitely sort of like knew that she had a job to do and it felt really amazing for us and so the back cover of each um of each book has paw prints uh by uh Carolee's companion, um, Monimia. So one thing, one other thing about the book I do want to add is that we we left the um, we left the book true to its form. We didn't insert a new colophon, so it's a full facsimile of all the content as Carolee had created in 1972. But it does have a slip-in sheet, which credits, which shows these images from the original production, um, as well as uh, me and Carolee and the. Um, and, and La Nina um, si signing her work. So um, I thought that was a nice touch for us to kind of leave that outside of outside of the binding of the book. It's just kind of slipped within. And um, yeah, I think I, I think I covered all that I was wanting to say. And I'm, I look forward to questions if people have them afterwards. Thank you so much, Erin, um, and thank you, Lorraine. And now we're going to uh, go to Jasmine. Appreciate it. Great. Um, I am reading two passages and I'll just jump in into it. The first one is Prick of the Week. Prick of the Week. In my native land, there is a growing cult called the General, the genital reverencers, also known as fuck cherishers. These primitive and animalistic people believe fucking is their most rapturous, expressive, and integral act. They believe genitals are mysterious energy sources and are dedicated to respect and even worship them. They find genitals so compelling or beautiful in all their variations that they are known to make images of them sing about the genitals of beloveds in secret, in secret languages and have dreams laden with sexual references. In fact, they imagine that the genital function of man and woman embodies some electrical cosmic ecstasy pulse of all organic nature. Perhaps you've heard of this cult? Due to the pervasive influences of the genital reverencers, I am unable to understand certain of your English customs. Can friends clarify the following? Genital Ghosts heads a column, Cunt of the Week, a politician who accepts the starvation of 5,000 people with equanimity. A couple signal to a cab. It does not stop for them. The man screams after the cab, you cunt. Men and women are watching a sport on television. A player drops a ball. The men yell, cunt, stupid cunt. Some men are discussing another man who has betrayed them. They detest him and sum up his character as an utter cunt. My questions, is a cunt something that makes men angry or afraid? Does it stand for what they hate or what betrays them? Do English women call each other, you cunt? Or do, or do English women scream, you prick, when the taxi won't stop? Do English men who say, you cunt, caress, stroke, kiss, put their fingers on and in a real cunt? Sincerely yours. Cuntily Snowball, London, NW3. <laughs> Some of these letters have been shortened due to the pressures of space and the irresponsibility of the editor. Please address letter to the editor, friends, 307 Portobello Road, London, W10. Dear Clayton, 3rd of August, 1971. So then, did Anais Nin's monkey wish to have been offered pancakes to be included for the taste of them, for the aroma, for the shape? I bet the squashed banana tasted wonderful by his changing it. 
And I didn't think my last letter sad. Do you have me in a sadness bag? Issue through and through that the various feelings coexist in me and my undertaking is to express that all that as immediacy reality to no longer be falling into the fissures of intention, idealization, willfulness. It seems to me that the hard work is the realization of the interrelated positive and negative weaves, deeper, more manifold than hate or love. What you call complaint, a moan. My hope by necessity to let go of all of, all of it, move it so that it might be recognized. Confirming to others who have themselves found sorrow, desperation, deprivation, a stage of adventure within the longer, larger circles of life changes, crucial even for the lack of being fresh and noble. Maybe it's not itself interesting enough or not written well or an imposition, super imposition, on our friendship image of me puerile, draining, annoying, unacceptable weakness. Did you think I was asking for money sources for me? I didn't. It was all about sources for Caterpillar. I'm relieved you have the trust to work with, been into the Breckage MoMA letters, how we have to fight every inch of inching, the proportion of effort to affect the least improvement is so extreme, tearing apart time, heart, vision, pace, that every outrage linking me to Kelly's in June narrative. And another level, which use men, I found in his writing and any other where I am missing gender study on the use of gender in our language. And into the compacted circuitry issue of Cedar Pillar, overcoats of Eden, of Eden. So wonderful that the tree with bathtub and its roots, your family sweeping interchange of being whom you love and speak with as creations of language. The child you were become very clear with rhythms of childhood cycling, funny poignancy behind the garage while the great Reich was actually thinking of him and into the Blackburn journals, physically transported his set of actual environment, landscape crystal clear present. And it wasn't sad, Anthony and me traipsing around Manhattan, a delicious conspiracy, our love and work together chopped every obstacle. We use them for our love and work, realize that natural fluidity we could Filmed, taped, chopped, touched, stroked, placed in our hands, whatever did confront us by magnitude of situation or by magnitude of our perception. And that can be microscopic or the screen gone black for our voices to carry image. And absorb delights. We also do have a very quiet, close, tender life as source. The tenderness cushions reverberates, makes us flexible. There is nothing to withhold, to secret away. I am not afraid. To be myself, still the terror lurks from the past, battering, loss, hubris. So yes, primarily he is taking care of me. Why do I believe I've just gotten through two solitary years? alone with myself, more alone than ever in the past, and you suggest being alone now? Not only do I have to eat, I have to be eaten. Two raw years, elements of constancy, kitsch, the plot of grass, the earth and day after day without love, without the fuck of love, touch of love, perception of being perceived, cooking a meal, passing a book with love, with affection, with warmth, with moments of passion day after day. Friendship, but no rooted love to consequence. Building, communion. I don't belong out there. I don't know who does. Some loneliness 
better than others. It was a lesson I didn't want to have to learn, but did. The enclosed notes will probably seem desperate to you. It is as if I am trying to find what is you do not just understand, that I want you to understand, just as you seem to keep showing me a possibility of self, which I feel I need and keep missing, and you're not sure why. Well, there was so much misapprehension, noise when I was singing for joy, integrity of body senses, mulch of life and the form, and did finally make people pleasing, pleasing feeling, accepting that mistakes are made some by faith that they be revelatory. I no longer care to be very right and smart. Limitations delimit, that is given us focus to create shape, describe what is. Much love, C. Would you like me to read the last one? I don't know how we are for time. Okay. From letters. July, 1971. Dear Clayton, I don't feel that you feel sorry for me, but annoyed with me for being fresh and noble, stymied. If that cripple would only throw down his crutches, he, he could run. Clayton didn't understand his very freedom as man to feel, judge, create an act that does ennoble and renew him, keeps him whole, keeps his eye. Something about your perception of me is cockeyed. For us service body, corpses circle sky, we slip through each other's fingers into the divide, searching for one another as precedent. She did disillusion of spirit, audacity, creativity, forbidden expression of our inner will. We go limp, become meek to spare men, their terror of us, which can never have substance as awful as their terror of us to save the pain of him in secret gestures telling, you can't, don't do that other. To create seemed to me such an assertion of the strongest part of me that I would no longer be able to give all those I love the feeling of their being stronger and they would love me less, Nin. I'm trying to give you a secret life clue saying, yeah, you almost got it. Now watch this. Yes, fair enough to see, watch being known. Now how you gave me the courage to let fly and then says, well, the quality is less than. Ona said, I can't bear the shrill hysterical tone of women's lib and their aggrieved writings. Intelligent as they are, they should have style, control and clarity. How else will they convince or begin to have others understand their position? Who cares? Fuck off, Fink Ona. Dear you, can't stop Pandora's box. And it's yours to opening the cage. Daddy, sorry, Ona. You got mad beast locked in your heart, locked up and you're not loving. You're not working. You're being like sucked over mommy to great causes, looking for great men. Barrage your being body mana, almost sucked out dry, almost driven out of your own big house by your harborings. You come angry and confused and say, what about me? Tip the table over, start over alone, aggressive acts to reclaim what? Crumpled on your bed, causes scattered around imagining. Now you're freely willed for another beginning. What it could have been. What hold out to you? You who give out curses to make those you want to love stronger while you diminish giving and giving to win love, to erect image substance burning in your never finding every primal confirmation as self within self and never believing it was denied you who has everything. You said, my father treated me as he did his sons. I had all the privileges and advantages my brothers had. I was a tomboy. I was smarter than the boys and let it show. Of course he destroyed my mother. My father screaming at me over dinner, 
don't use those damn big words. Do you want to make your brother feel stupid? I want my weakness acceptable as well as my strengths. Clayton, to freely express my demons, your condemning note, the cat who knows better, but knocks over a figurine. Before you try to change it, you better see what it is. I knew it as a risk to present the disallowed, shrill, protesting female, etc., which is an aspect of my reality, as well as any other characteristic I know you could care for, respond to. An act of independence would be punished by desertion. I would abandon by those I loved. Men fear women's strengths. I have been deeply aware of men's weakness, the need to guard them from my strength. I have made myself less powerful have concealed my powers. I see strongly creative women crush their men. I fear this. I have feared all aggressiveness, all attacks, all destruction, above all self-assertion. The Diary of Anais Nin III. You don't understand that. It is not about loving or hating men, but about treatment in the total culture about a tenting ring rung expression away forbidden even the call that self full ego to be confirmed without punishment or punishing in turn. The blue papers are not my unique private endless story that becoming simply a complaint, a moan instead of staying an adventure. And the black mammy steps to stage right as Rufus and Porgy are dragged away to be sold at market turns her sorrowing eyes to the sky and sings, oh Lord, there's a new day coming. I've been hoping to let you see the sad old story is breaking, is passing, but the savagery I've experienced in two years alone is unusually felt, sorry, usually felt, experienced with related desperation by other women going through it and has to do with forces, conditions deep in our culture. Lay it out as process, not simply self-pity, heating. I never use those words. What has been done to women, what we do to ourselves, what we carry as a plague, denying integrity and what men carry to us as perplexity and distaste for our otherness, for our very subjugation to them. Adventures, many adventures, smothered partition and sullies. The blue papers deal with that. Anthony had to wait seven months to come to me. Had he not had to wait, the blue papers wouldn't exist. Had he not come to me, the blue papers would very likely still be ongoing. You must imagine I've made some dreadful stance to take two years to have a partner, not married to someone else, living with someone else, or riddled with taboos, prohibitions, fears, physical denials and constraints. One man not divided in his nature. Is it that being in love, he touched me totally? Is it that touching totally brought being in love? Jaeger, by being true to the woman, created the woman in me. By her particular intuition as a woman has penetrated truths not observed by either Alan D or Rank. The creator's guilt in me has to do with my femininity, my subjection to man. Also with my maternal self in conflict with my creative self, a negative form of creation. Also the content of my work is related to the demon in me, the adventure loving, and I do not feel this adventurousness a danger to my loves. Guilt about exposing the father, Nin. And men assuming us to be their depositories, treasure chests, keepsakes, and even telling the woman what she really feels. Can you imagine that Whenever I speak, whenever I speak, there is a convulsion of guilt behind my eyes. She should keep quiet. In the gentlest, loving voice, touching my hand in the hem of my dress, saying, 
little girls don't do that. Your mommy never did that when she was a, it goes from here to Wolf, to Bouvier, to Greer, Millet, Mead, or way back to Margaret Sanger or others we are discovering. Not a concern of mine. If you remember the papers, research I did 10, 12 years ago on women artists whose works had been reattributed, all the late Davids, Tim Gerechos, some Halls, et cetera, et cetera. And the transmutation of the snake goddess, Minoan calendar gender attributes, topsy-turvy embattled Roman politics. And what her situation really is. I'm not knocking anything, just breaking up the old story a bit. So utterly conditioned not to fight in terror of my own aggressions, the defeat implied in making defense, but to fight yet for the expression, their home base, even pain, fear, anger, flight, fight to state, I know it as all, all truths, even as demon and failing guilt for the undercurrent pursuero pressed upon those whose masculine will I needed to defend, me to do battle. My great will and insight, leaning into them as Nin says, we have lived through those unlike ourselves, salvation of what we could not permit to exist in ourselves. Repeat after me. I'm frightened, helpless, and need protection. Protect me. I am big, terrible, and dangerous. Look out. I am frightened, helpless, and need protection. Protect me. I am big, big, terrible, and dangerous. Look out. I am frightened, helpless, and need protection. Protect me. I'm terrible and dangerous. Look out. I'm frightened, helpless, and need protection. Protect me. I'm big, terrible, and dangerous. Look out. Practice chant for cheerleaders four of each three times daily. For now, with love, Carolee. Thank you, Jasmine. Thank you very, very much. Um, and now I'd like to turn it to Stephanie. I'm gonna be reading um, from Parts of a Body House, the second part. And each one is, um, in a little paragraph telling about what the room is to begin with. Lung room, heart chamber, cunt chamber, ice palace. Walking south, you will arrive at the lung room. Huge transparent glimmering lungs, seemingly suspended in air, stretched at varying angles, levels through an endless space. You might best traverse these net-like lungs on hands and knees, crawling over the stretched membrane. In the center of a lung, you can do jumps and falls, using it like a trampoline. Many people are crawling around. Others have curled up, fallen asleep on the lungs. Others are holding hands, bouncing through space from one lung to another. The transparent lungs are luminous. There is no other light to define space. A leap in the dark from an easterly lung, falling briefly, a sudden landing in the heart chamber, cunt chamber, enormous soft velvety, warm, damp walls, rounded ridge, pulse gently. Your whole body is squeezed up and down between pulses. You can clamber around, holding onto the ridges. Each ridge you touch emits a flash of brilliant colored lights. It is slippery. The muscle walls expand, contract, push you slightly up or down. You may doze in the strange rocking. Only one or two persons at a time in this chamber. When you wish, being to crawl down, head first, pushing between contractions. Exit. You arrive in the ice palace and are handed ice skates. This is simply a great frozen internal pond where everyone skates. Good old fashioned skating music echoes everywhere. A stand sells hot dogs and coffee. The nerve ends room. The nerve ends room is evolved as a free, flowing, self-perpetuating, self-destroying energy environment using active elements of orgasmic streaming, organic gardening, electroculture, birds and joyful technology, extrasensory perception, wildlife preservation, Lenny Bruce, Black Power, Bach, Beatles, Beast Song, Synesthesia, Kinesthesia, ecstatic physical interchange. Participants will freely choose music, noise, light, season, stars, galaxies, winds, colors, photo cell activation, circuit, cutoff, slides, films, laser beams, traffic signals, dirt, sand, mud, grease, powder. Friendly animals, fabrics, SCRs, water, fires, ropes, swings, ladders, smells. Aromas, wood, nails, hammers, saws, chisels, trees, shrubs, flowers, costumes, and agree only that their choices may exist. Simultaneously in juxtaposition with choices of others in the same time-space continuum. The participants will be able to select their materials in advance. 
They may also build or activate parts of the environment with found materials or by using preset electronic circuits, sensory components. Parts of a body house, page three, determined by computer programs. The found materials can be used in any imaginable way, alone or in cooperation with other people. Maximum sensory information in strange immediate physical circumstance will provoke actions, reactions in developing involvement. People will be bombarded, charged, as they shape and reshape the environment. Earplugs, eyes, masks, perfume, tiny lights, and hunks of foam rubber to build chambers will be available to disperse environmental conflagrations to provide utter quiet, for private turnings in, turnings on, LSD, DMT, pop, alcoholic drinks, mushrooms, vitamins, strange and common foods will be available. The nerve end rooms will be situated in a transparent bubble in a woods to facilitate exchange of inside and outside, actual landscape and fantastic landscape. Finally, a memory band will be available to everyone by which they can open travel into their experiences to anyone desiring to go where they've been. My memory bank idea is fully described in English magazine, Icteric. Genital play, erotica meat room, hair and fingers room. The genitals play, erotica meat room in the center of the body house may be chosen instead of the gorilla gut room. A large curving space filled entirely with wonderfully fashioned over life size pricks, balls, nipples, clitoris, labia majora, labia minora, cunts and assholes. They'll be lifelike in variations of details. Color, aroma, and moisture constructed from flesh-like material, they completely cover walls, floors, ceilings. They're electrically charged, and when handled properly, they will undergo like-like transformations. And as they are touched, they communicate to the toucher, flood the toucher with the most extreme sensations they could normally feel. The genitals meet are disposed so that it is possible to climb on them, swing on them, ride, run, and jump among them on the time receiving an ecstatic electrical current. Being a putting on, Attacking off and opening and following a strange courtship, a romance. Not all forms of violence are destructive. Foam forms for energy, streams followed into movement, moment, taken color, textures, physical necessity, immediacy. An image. In your own time, your own way with another, no one can predict how this room will affect them. How will they affect this room? Let insights follow delight. A common structure is to be alone in one section, crowded in another, non-interference, cooperation, new modes of reciprocal play, love, electrical, pandemonium, harmony, wild encounters, any manner. Hair and fingers room. A resting place after the nerve ends room, a genital play erotica meat room. An attic full of couches, chairs, big sofas made from oversized soft finger shapes covered with webs, clumps of hair, different textures, colors, aromas, a tiny labyrinth where it is always possible to lie down. Be sleep, curl up on fingers covered with lengths of warm hair. Silent, a warm breeze, always twilight. Kidney room, the gorilla gut. In the kidney room, people come together to discuss revolution that is changing or transforming. Political reforms, which are repressive, exploitative, divisive, and life negative. It is a simple outdoor space, a vague sheltering landscape, daytime light, a luminescent green bile run, river runs by. There are three large kidneys to sit on, they are made of stone. They form a semicircle on a grassy bank. On the opposite side of the Bile River is a long tract of jungle and forest in which four city blocks are situated, a military installation, and a harbor. This complex is called the Out. In the gut, people gather to enact various guerrilla exercises which last from a few hours to a few months. A basic guerrilla life theater, which includes living alone, living together, confined, loving, arguing, how to build and choose together, how to fulfill tasks, finding food and water in their distribution, cooking without an open fire, sewing, first aid, jumping, catapulting across obstacles, crawling for hours, scaling walls, running, carrying, and lifting bodies, hiking from one place to another without directions in the night and the day, climbing trees, hide and seek, planting traps, sleeping under leaves in mud and sand, in continually improvised environment using found materials, in <clears throat> basic skills and building will be tried, making traps, simple explosives, rope knotting, locking roads, buildings in the harbor will be attempted, and within the gut labyrinth, the people have reunions after separations, celebrations around fires, dancing before difficult tasks, reading the stars, gardening, falling in love for moments or years. In an open field, they may develop self-defense methods, camouflage masks, disguised as pageantry, Nonverbal communication will be set up using fire and light signals. Marks and signs made or found in the landscape and communication by mutual body energy awareness. Special, special technical effects and certain physical relationships of people and materials will be monitored. 
from the neurobend's room and may be adapted to uses for the gut. Thank you very, very much. Um, we're all gonna come together now uh, for a question and answer period. And I would encourage anyone who wants to, to please um, post questions in the Q and A. Um, we would love to have them. I was hoping I could um, open with a question for, um, for everyone that was, it's you know a bit of, I guess, of a, a comment that I was thinking coming off of what you just read, Stephanie, which is the, the very, specificity of Carolee's vision and the details that she's willing to um, expound sort of for something that may or may not be realized. I find really fascinating in connection with Erin, how you described the, the production of this book um, and the sort of reproduction of it and the way in which each of those materials um, was not a kind of element of fantasy, right? But had been chosen specifically and needed and needed to be reproduced exactly. And that there's something really fascinating in that um, that I wanted to just highlight and see if we could talk about. And, and a second thing um, perhaps to suggest is just um, the very beginning when Maureen read um, one of the quotes I wrote down was the idea of liberation through joyous aggression. And one of the things that I love most about this book um, is it's a through line, right, for Carolee's work, but the ways in which um, it isn't just the kind of, you know, what she would uh, call an interior scroll, like the personal clutter and the persistence of feelings, right? But it's the humor behind that and the ways in which um, humor can work with anger, um, with sarcasm, right? To, to form, um, as I think this is the quote in the last section, that, that not all forms of violence are destructive, right? And that there's this, there can be a play between those two. Um, so I wondered if I could just ask um, ask one of you to to pick up on those um, or or something else that, that maybe struck you as as you were reading. And I really want to sincere sincerely thank you all once more. I will pose. Go ahead, Stephanie. I can talk a little, I mean, I love that quote that you said um, as well. And I feel like it's very Carly to sort of also talk about the, um, the kind of the paradox and all of the things that she writes about or talks about and the like having two um, opposing forces that exist together in term and create and um, sort of fuse, so to speak in creation of other things. Um, and I, I, I love that quote about um, violence as well, I think. Um, and also the lists, you, if you read through these lists, they're all sort of, you know, butting heads, a lot of them. And that's very Carolee, I think, as well. Um, if yeah. Um, I'm going to open it up to a question from the audience um, from Eric Smigel, thank you everyone for realizing this beautiful project. I'm curious what you may have learned or remembered about Kara Lee during the process of creating and performing the reprint. Um, and I wonder, Lorraine, if we could begin with you. Um, you know, I, I, um, I think I know Carol Lee more as a performer than as a writer. And so it was obviously a big um, pleasure to see that, uh, in fact, uh, she was a poet. And, um, and she was much more of a poet than, uh, than a prose writer, for sure. And so I, um, I was able to understand much more, I think, as a result of um, you know, getting into this uh, piece. I wish I'd had more time to get into it further, but you know, I did my best. Um, but I, I, I felt that I got much closer to her sexuality than I ever had even in her performances, I have to say. Um, so, um, and, and I think, what is, it, what is it that made me get further into it by way of the poetry? I, I do think it has to do exactly with what other people have been talking about, which is um, um, ambiguity and, um, 
and not not contradictoriness, but um, but the ability to contain so many different forms of sexuality, so many different attitudes toward any individual sexual experience, so many different attitudes towards her own sexual her own self. Uh, this was what I thought was. I don't think that I don't think that in her performances I had sensed quite so deeply the uh, the complexity of her not not of her mind but of her of her spirit you know. Okay. Thank you, Jasmine. I wonder if you would say a few words, perhaps, about something um, that struck you during your. Sure. Um, so this was also my I think I guess my first time really going through the book in its entirety. And um, I also, like Lorraine, knew and know um, Carolee more for the performance work, um, which is generally what I speak about with my students. So it was really exciting to kind of see the literary inner workings that correlate so well with the performances. And I think it was a, is a, an entry point to understanding the performances more. Um, and I think reading them out loud also made me realize that even though they're in a literary format, um, that format in and of itself is has a performance element and an incredibly emotive and theatrical element too, um, which I guess through and through, she was a kinetic performance artist, even in writing. Mm -hmm. Erin, I wonder if um, it strikes you uh, reading the text um, that sort of in a different way than having worked materially with it, because it, it must be hard to hold those two things together as you're producing the book in some ways. Oh, you're muted, Erin. Yeah, I was just thinking about that because I have, I have two memories that are really material based but that really um, make me feel a lot closer to the work and then hearing the text read in this in this environment really kind of makes me think about it in, in, in that way, it, which is not one that is my relationship to the book or it wasn't during production. Um, and one is that, you know, there are several parts of the book that are highlighted. So there's areas where she went in and she highlighted a section around a figure um, in, in a few places and she signed her name we reproduced her signature by a silk screen, but all of the handwriting and the highlighting, I sat down and did it. And this was like in the dead of winter that I was doing this. I was all alone. This was, this was you know, in 2000, the winter of 2019, I guess. And these were the last components of the book and our staff was on vacation. And we had, you know, I just, I was like, I'm just gonna do this. And I kind of just sat and recreated these hand motions with the highlighter on the pages. And it was all of a sudden, I sort of understood that mark in this completely different way. And I could see the way that the, the, the image was reproduced and part of the figure had been lost in the mimeograph. And so the intention in the highlighter was to bring these two components of these two bodies that are engaged in a sexual act to bring them together with like an emphasized yellow line. And that was something that I didn't see in production and that broadened my way of understanding this drawing you know so it's like there's an intimacy that I have with these pages that no one else has really but also um that that also are kind of preventative sometimes from me fully understanding the text as vividly as it is being performed by everyone tonight so um it's unique um I did try to cut one corner on the on the book <laughs> and I like to share this story because I don't really believe in the afterlife. I don't believe, I would love to believe in ghosts or something, but I don't. Um, and uh, there was, there's on Americana eating apple pie on that page, there's a coffee stain. Um, I was like, you know what? This is the last thing to be recreated. I'm just not doing it. No one's gonna know but me. I'm not gonna do the coffee stain. And then I looked down at the page and I noticed on the printed page that there was a circle, the exact size of the coffee stain on the page in the spot it's supposed to be. And I looked closely and it was a hair, like a hair had fallen and like landed in a perfect circle on the page where the circle coffee stain goes. And I thought, oh, fine. 
I'm not going to, I'll do the coffee stain because <laughs> I felt like that was a, a signal from <laughs> the, uh, the other side or something that was like, heard me fantasizing about cutting one corner. Um, <laughs> and so the coffee stain is on the Americana I Ching apple pie page uh, reproduced with espresso as it was supposed to be done. <laughs> I want to really thank everyone um, for being here tonight. Um, I, I realize that it's it's going on 720 and I want to give everyone a chance to have a little bit more of their evening. But thank you to Lorraine. Thank you to Jasmine. Thank you to Stephanie. Thank you to Aaron. Um, I feel really excited by having heard the words, right, rather than just read them. And I really think that it was um, a really wonderful evening. So I really appreciate that you are all here. So um, with that, Really would love to um, wish everyone a good rest of their week and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.